The reason why Neighbours is more widely used is because of the purpose that Neighbours has been set up for. Neighbours enables us to compare buildings with buildings. It assists uh, the monitoring of, um, of energy, waste and water use. Um, it can uh, demonstrate the carbon emissions from uh, the building on a year's data. And so it's a, a valuable tool for assessing building against building and the performance of that building over time. The, um, the value of Green Star is the Green Star is, is like a pallet upon which you can build. And you can build uh, in many different areas from community through nature through to, to carbon through to energy. The, um, at the moment, uh, I believe the ease of access to create a neighbour's rating and the purpose of the neighbour's rating tool to compare building stock it is why it's quite a central tool at the moment in the industry and particularly with government and leasing of buildings. The, the Green Star system um, does work hand in hand with neighbours and also uh, can work hand in hand with other systems such as Wells, such as Passive House, such as Living Building Challenge. We, um, we have worked in all of those areas and um, I feel that the, the Green Star uh, system, although quite well, well advanced in many respects, it is still in the early stages of its potential. The, uh, a project we looked at for government in the last um, year or so uh, looked at several aspects of an existing building. And it, it didn't adopt uh, the Green Star system. We looked at the NCC, the National Construction Code, and the performance of the building against the National Construction Code. It was a building that was some 40 years old, and we were looking at the value of uh, demolishing it and replacing it with another building, and the implications uh, to a wasted embodied energy in that process, or, Recycling the building, refurbishing the building um, with emphasis on the building facade. It included the interiors and circulation. But we basically looked at the National Construction Code level as a benchmark modelling with a thermal envelope analysis. Then we looked at a neighbour's uh, five-star rating to see what would have to be done to the existing building to bring it to neighbour's five-star level. Uh, then we also included data to see what would be required to bring it to passive house standard. So there was an example of using uh, neighbours, um, the neighbours system to analyse an existing building to determine the feasibility of recycling it, uh, refurbishing it or demolishing it and replacing it. Uh, and then looking at uh, the extremes, the National Construction Code as a base level, neighbours five star as the preferred um, minimum level of 4.5 star with government at the moment and then to see what would be the costs and the additional works to bring it to passive house level and the beauty of that approach was that we were using one existing system um, neighbors we were looking at the national construction code as the benchmark which is also used in green star and then we were looking at passive house system to see what would be the enhancements that we would need to move it beyond Neighbours 5 Star to another level, considering that our cycle of renovating and refurbishing buildings can, can be anywhere in Australia in government from 20 to 40 years. Neighbours, as a system to analyse uh, energy, carbon, water and waste over a 12-month cycle, uh, is a very useful um, benchmarking tool for existing building stock. Uh, the beauty of Green Star is it's being applied mainly to new building works and uh, at a holistic level. The two systems, uh, in my view and from the experience of how I've seen the systems being used, uh, will exist in parallel 
um, and there may be some merging over time. One's uh, the Green Star being developed by industry and the property council and and uh, building owners and the like, and neighbours being developed by uh, government. The uh, there is cross fertilisation between the two systems with um, several of the of the members of the boards on one being on the other and with the industry advice back to government and to Green Star. So in my mind, uh, the benefits of Neighbours is very clear to, to this benchmark and comparison of existing building stock. And the tool can be used then to inform uh, Green Star um, through uh, predicted uh, energy use and building use um, for uh, credit 22 in the Green Star system. From that, from that basis, I would see that not only is Neighbours and Green Star able to exist in parallel and also cross-fertilise, there's also an option um, for, as mentioned by Green Star, to adopt and embrace qualities of many of the other systems. And I think particularly Passive House Living Building Challenge and the Wells system all have qualities that are quite different that contribute um, to um, better, more sustainable building stock and landscape environments for community, for society, for individuals and for nature. Um, that's on the plus side uh, and on the, the, um, the opportunity and the challenge side from here is that there's many, many aspects of um, the Green Star system which in the end lift the quality of buildings beyond the National Construction Code. And the question will be is how far are they being lifted? How far do they need to be lifted? And the elements that we need to be, become more accurate with is the full life cycle experience of any resource, of any material, um, from the time it's um, found or extracted or grown until the time it's returned to either a new situation, fully recycled, um, repurposed or returned to earth. At the moment, even elements such as um, FSC certified timbers, if they come from example from managed plantations that fit the current guidelines of, um, of best practice forestry, they may still be um, not working to support the, uh, the needs of the planet and the balance between uh, forest and cleared space and urban space. Uh, recently I was reviewing um, the different role of um, sustainable practices in urban lifestyles and in village lifestyles. And I came across a peer-reviewed data that looked at an American city where 70% of the urban precinct was covered by roads. And uh, I think in analysing Neighbours, Green Star and the other areas of uh, building sustainability systems, and then moving from sustainability um, a sustainability paradigm which was improving on existing building stock and moving towards a regenerative um, creation and habitat paradigm, it, it, it starts to look at when we need to build or whether we need to build at all or whether there's opportunity to look at the existing uh, building uh, stock and urban and semi-urban, suburban and rural and village infrastructure to see how we might reconsider the, the needs of society and nature and our response, whether it's a building or whether it's a changed approach to precinct, habitat and um, movement. Now this, this extends out neighbours and green staff from considering a building and, and a landscape environment to the urban context. Why I bring that up is because before COVID, I was involved in a discussion 
with architects and town planners. And the discussion hinged around the most effective way to deal with an urban context to enable people to move from, uh, let's say, from home to childcare, to school, to work, uh, to retail areas, to nature areas, and then to um, aged care areas and to facilities and services areas from sport to recreation to health, was to have a very uh, powerful and um, uh, well-supported, well-presented public transport system. And uh, until this was actually in March of 2020, this discussion, prior to COVID affecting Australia. And within a few weeks, um, the very busy peak hour traffic of the morning and afternoon had diminished. Um, the skies had started to clear. I was told more um, during the latter part of last year that the water in Venice had cleared so you could see the fish and uh, many other parts of um, the planet had started to clear from uh, air pollution, uh, from, from industry and manufacturing to some extent, and particularly from our public transport system and urban transport networks. I think the point that's worth making is that given that we've got um, now an opportunity to reconsider um, the facilities that are required to support uh, a mobile population, as has been the case, particularly for the last 100 years, and then the impact of COVID on our mobility, uh, it, it's shown that there is the flexibility available to us in how we might set up um, the various stages of life and um, the differentiation between um, public and private space, home space and workspace, and the dynamic between all the other aspects of life and needs throughout from birth to death. The, um, the best situations to come out of reconsidering how we accommodate our needs in buildings and landscape was shown that the, from the view of centralised ability to live, work and be at home in a situation that requires a minimum of public transport enables engagement with um, preschoolers, children, elderly and uh, local resources such as community gardens, community workplaces. And this would be um, not only require a repurposing of some of the building and landscape stock that exists in all communities on the planet, but also enables a reconsidering of what we need to build and why we need to build it when it's demonstrated that uh, refurbishing and recycling building stock is far more effective at diminishing or minimising embodied energy. And... Um, the, the aim of creating a carbon neutral environment and, and not only sustaining uh, our community and lifestyle, but also a sustaining nature and um, the various forces that, that operate on the planet. Um, winds, storms, fires and uh, natural bio, binome, biomes that... Um, create life on the planet, I, th I feel that there's an opportunity to reconsider how we build um, and why we build and where we build and how we repurpose building fabric to enable the uh, minimising of mobility that's unnecessary. And I, I feel that uh, with, with the... With COVID requiring us to change our habits, our mobility habits, what it's done is enabled the consciousness or awareness of us all to reconsider just how we function. And so what is very much a modern 
paradigm, uh, the mobility of moving from work to, to the office and from being looked after when you're young, being looked after when you're young, being looked after when you're elderly, all in remote locations, uh, having a building where you sleep and live on the weekends and at morning and night, and having a building where you um, go to work, and then having a transport mechanism, as I said, that can take and create up to 70% of an urban area land cover in roads, uh, is not a balanced or sustainable approach. Yet it is the, the, the approach that's very much uh, of modern times, of the last century or two. COVID and like, and the changing um, nature of the planet and the stresses that's been put on urban development as our population has increased, um, has been shown up as being quite stressed under COVID in the way that much of the planet recovered when we had lost our mobility. So an upside to COVID is taking the ideas of how we approach building and assessing the um, carbon neutral nature of buildings and design and how we integrate with nature and community and society and taking it a step further to include our whole approach to how we set up and create an urban development. And it may be that uh, return to micro villages uh, across the planet in a way as a response to the limitations that COVID created would help deal with not only the issue of um, a similar pandemic should they occur again or continue in the current form, uh, but also enable a um, restoring and regenerating of the planet uh, in a different way than we might have envisaged uh, by repurposing building stock and by restructuring the way our community and society interacts and connects with each other through, through a, a mobility that's become the norm, but has been demonstrated to be a very expensive component um, outside the building stock that we are trying to work with.